Three main characteristics of this Christian race. Number one is that it is a set race. You must understand because it is already set. God has set before us, it says. God has set the race before. It's not our race, any old how we want to run and we run here, we run there, but God has set that personal race for us. Number two, it is a personal race. It is a race that, you know, nobody can run for you. You must run it yourself. And although the race may be difficult, there are mountains high and valleys low, and there may be gravel, there may be stones around the way, there may be large boulders and so on, but yet you still have to run that race yourself. We can run with you, but we cannot run for you. So that's a personal race that all of us have to run. You may carry your baggages with you. No one can carry that baggage with you. We can pray alongside with you and so on. But you, you are the one who should lay off or strip off all the baggages that you have holding you. And later on, we'll take a look at what are some of the common baggages and issues. And thirdly, it is a forward-looking race. The race is set before us. So we cannot run and retreat and say, no, I'm not going to run this way, I'm going to run backwards. Because backwards is where you come from and you don't want to go back where you come from. And when you run forward, it is running towards the finishing line. Now, every athlete knows that what they want to do is to score the goal. Whether you are a runner, whether you are a swimmer, or whether you are a, a, a team that plays basketball, you want to win the goal. And so here in our personal race, in our Christian race, we want to win the prize for the upward call of God, the goal that Paul was talking about, G-O-A-L, not G-O-L-D. And the goal is that when you see Jesus at the finishing line, Jesus is going to command you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have persevered well, you are faithful, and you are done well. Enter into the joy of my master. So this is what we want to hear at the end of the day, at the end of the race, that when we run with endurance, our focus, Lord Jesus, is at that finishing line. Just as the runner thinks that the finishing line is just a line across, and once they dash that line and break that line, they're going to get a goal. And so that is the same for all of us. Amen? Amen. Only one. All right. What is it that slows us down? What is it that slows us down? This is a list of what we have... I have actually talked about and we have ministered to a lot of people, both Pastor David and I, and most of people that we ministered have all these issues. So there are nine different types. Of course, this list is not exhaustive. You can actually, you know, have other baggages and all that as well. So baggages that come from our past, we bring it along with us even in our Christian walk. You know, baggages that we have in our present situation that will also wear us all down. So, rejection, jealousy, envy, anger, pride, grief, sorrow, regrets and guilt, fear and anxiety, addiction and temptation, offenses and unforgiveness. All these are the ones that actually trip us up and weigh us down. So, I want to suggest to you today, I want to go into specific aspects of the list and then after that, give you a little bit on the ways that we can overcome it. And then after that, at the end, I'm going to wrap it up with ways to maintain our healing and our freedom in Christ. Sounds good? Okay. Sounds good? Yes, that's right. Pastor David just asked me, can you do it fast? I said, no, I cannot run the race fast with all these baggages. So we're going to throw it one by one. And when we do it, we can run fast. Amen. Now, rejection is a very complex issue. Very complex. We have a rejection tree that out from the rejection tree sprouts so all the fruit and what we call the symptoms of rejection. But primarily, rejection actually means to throw away as anything which is useless or vile, to cast off, to refuse to grant, to refuse to accept. All right? Uh, rejection means out of throwing away, the art of casting off, forsaking, refusal to accept or even grant. You, people may reject you. Mm. People reject you, it becomes personal. People may re not reject what you say, not reject what you propose, not reject what you want things to be done. So there's a casting off. I don't like this idea. I don't like this proposal. Your boss may throw it back at you. That's rejection. 
all right? And sometimes we get offended and sometimes we get hurt. We get pain because somebody, some things that we, we want to feel accepted has been taken away. Rejection, therefore, has all of this. Be ignored by someone you love, especially someone you love. Be ignored by him or her. Having been left by a parent or a guardian and feeling that you don't belong. Don't belong in the family. Don't belong in the, in the, in the, in the church. Don't belong even in, in, in the office, in the, in the workplace. You are left alone. No one to help you, especially by those whom, who should love you, actually, who should protect you. I read of, of, you know, children, very young children who have been mistreated, abused, even sexually abused by their stepfather. How is that so that their, their own mother can stand by and allow the stepfather to sexually abuse her own children? It's unthinkable. That's a lot of rejection issues there. Not able to trust anyone anymore. Once you're rejected, you can't even trust God. Say, so how can God allow these things to happen? You can't trust Him. Feelings of unworthiness and no value, feelings of uselessness. I can't do anything. Everything I do is wrong. Every idea I throw is wrong. So I'm not going to do anything. I'd rather give up. That's what rejection will say to you. Feelings of not being loved and accepted. You aren't important. No, your needs are important. I overlook them. Feeling that no matter what you do, it's not good enough and driven to perform to be loved. Rejected people reject others. Why? It's because they do not want to feel rejected anymore. They do not want to feel the pain of being rejected. Therefore, they reject others. Before you reject me, I reject you first. You know, that kind of situation. It's a coping mechanism of a person being rejected. And so they say, I'm, not going to, I'm, I'm just going to build these walls of defense around me. I'm not going to... Have anyone to talk, tell me, talk to me, or tell me what to do? I'm not going to tell you and talk to you and tell you what to do. This is what rejection does. Because if, if, you, if, if the war is broken, they, the rejected people feel very vulnerable. They feel that they are so weak, they cannot defend themselves, so they build walls around them. All right? So, driven, and some people cope by drivenness. That means they, like, they, they just want to drive themselves to work. They drive themselves to obtain a performance. You know, and then after that, the boss says, it's very good, okay, do well, all right? So they are happy because of that. If I cannot overcome rejection, I'm going to prove to you that I am good and I can do the job. Ways to overcome rejection and know that, first of all, no, when I say no, it is belief and understand and know in your heart and in your mind that you are always loved and accepted by God, Amen. Now, no matter God doesn't, 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 you know, have KPI and say that, oh, you're good, I will give you this, you're good. God, God loves you for who you are and God loves you for what you do and not what you cannot do or what you can do. God loves you. That's it, finish, full stop, zilch. Okay, that is what God, and, and you're, you are secure in the love of God. Be secured in God's love. Be secured in God Himself. Know that He loves you. He has, a, he has a future and a plan that He gives towards you. And your identity is secure in knowing that God loves you. And that's it, you know. No matter how people say bad things about you or, or reject you or hurt you, but know this, that God loves you. And that is all that matters. Because God is your creator. God is your family father. Amen. And if you do things approved by others and not proved by God, so what is it? It's disobedience. We want things to be done, you know, approved by God, accepted by God. Know that Jesus took all our rejection on the cross. So what is the cross? The cross is where Jesus was abandoned and rejected, inverted common by, the, by, by God the Father. For one moment, He was on the cross. So what happened? The weight of the sin was upon him. And God, being the heavenly Father, who is sinless and holy, cannot, cannot take it for a while. It has to turn away. And Jesus was abandoned so that we will not be abandoned. That is what the divine exchange has taken place. Know that you need to forgive. 
and love those who have rejected you. You know, I was given away from, from, uh, away from the family. I was already only about one year old. My mom told me soon afterwards I was given away to my father's first wife, my, kind of my, my first mother. And because, you know, my, 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 mother's, uh, my father's first wife has only one son, no daughters, and she was very lonely, so she said, can, you know, to my mom, can you give me one of your daughters? Because you have so many daughters, you have five daughters in the family. So give, give, give me the second youngest one, who is me, you know. My, my youngest one, my sister is just a baby and I was already one year old. So I was, I was the one that was given to my first mom. And then after that, I didn't really know this until I said, why am I feeling this issue of rejection all the time? You know, and then after that, my mom told me that, you know, when you, you didn't know this, but when you were about one year old, I actually um, uh, uh, gave you away to your first mom. And then, how, then why am I back here, mom? And she said that because I cannot take it. After one week, I took you back. But you see, the, the, it's, a, it's a spirit that's entered into you. And when, when you have already the, the separation the physical separation, you know, from your mom, you know, who is supposed to love you and protect you and want you all to himself or herself. That's my dad and my mom. But she has chosen with my dad's permission to give me away. And so I have to forgive my mom. I have to forgive my dad. And I appreciated my mom for having to bring me back after one week. And, and I know that, you know, uh, I... Then I told God, I said, God, you know, I, I, please help me overcome these rejection issues. And the Lord says, you know, Linda, you are my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. So it's the same uh, that he has talked to my, you know, to, to Jesus, his son. He said, you are my son and today I'm well pleased with you. And for that, there is healing, there is freedom after I've forgiven. But you need to choose to forgive because forgiveness is a choice. And the next one, so this is my rejection. I'm going to put it to the side here. All right, the next one is jealousy and envy. Very, very dangerous, jealousy and envy. I, I've seen a show where this woman uh, was so jealous of the other woman, and then you know, the other woman has almost snatched away her, the, the man that she really loves, and she has to plot, and she was so jealous and so envious, she has to plot how to take care of this woman and, and make this woman suffer and eventually wanted to kill this woman to end this woman's life so that she can have the guy to himself. But eventually, sin finds them out. And she was then, you know, um, the consequences of that sin find, them out, uh, find her out and eventually she really uh, was sent to jail because of something that she has done. Jealousy is a fear of being displaced by a rival in affection or of favor. And it corrupts our motives, corrupts our thoughts and actions. Envy, on the other hand, is a feeling of discontent and resentment aroused by another's desirable possessions or qualities. I envy you. You are prettier than me. You are more popular than me. You know, you do things better than me. All right, you have a bigger house than me. You have a bigger bank account, but who's going to tell you how much they have? You have a bigger account than me. And then you have prettier daughters, handsome sons than me. You have a bigger car than me. Envy. How many of us, have you heard of this green eye monster called Envy? Have you heard of this face? All right, green eye monster. Mm. Wait and see. Because they're always having this kind of, you know, things like, I want to get rid of you. This is a sin area. All right, Galatians 5.26 says, Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous or envy of one another. For whatever, wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, James 3.16, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Isn't that correct? When you are jealous or envy people, you just really want to get rid of the person. And you just say, that I'm going to do everything that I can. If you don't have the love of Christ, if you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart and in your life, you will do the things that you will destroy themselves, this person, and then therefore destroy yourself ultimately in the end because they've got consequences. All right? 
So let's take a look at how do we overcome jealousy and envy. Number two, acknowledge. First of all, we need to acknowledge people. Sometimes we are so blinded by our own issues that we don't see it. Other people see it, but we don't. And when they tell us, we get offended. Are you sure or not? You know, maybe, you know, you see wrongly. Like nobody tells us you're the only one who tell me, you know. How can it be and all that? So acknowledge, first of all, ask God to search your heart. Acknowledge that you have this jealousy and envy or envious of other people. Number two, choose by an act of your will to get rid of it. Now I say choose to get rid of it. It is true. Because you cannot just say, no, I'm done with jealousy and envy. I'm no longer jealous and envy anymore. That's not, that you can't. Because you have to say, Lord, I know that I'm jealous and envy. I'm so sorry. I need you to forgive me. Help me overcome this jealousy and envy. All right? So that's how, that's how it is. Then have a thankful and contented heart. Do you know that a lot of jealousy and envy arise because you're not contented with what you have? You're not contented with who you are? So have a thankful and contented heart and say, God, you have gifted me this face, this look, this body, and so on. I'm happy. I'm hap- I-, I receive it with gladness and thankfulness in my heart. You have gifted me. You have give t- gifted me so many talents and abilities. I'm not as talented as somebody, but I, I know, God, that you have given it to me, and I am very thankful, Lord. Be contented. In 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, it says, True godliness with contentment is great gain or great wealth it will bring you. True godliness with contentment. All right? So in other words, it says it, 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 you need to be contented with what you have and not what you do not have. And last of all, please don't compare yourself to other people. Do you know how tiring it is to live up to the Joneses and then I only need to compare, I need to compete I need to be better than the other person. Do you know it's very hard? It's very tiring. That's where you have the baggage. Others will always, there will always be people better than you. There will always be people richer than you. There will always be people who are, who, who are being blessed more than you. But let us be contented. Let us be thankful. And one of the antidotes of having to take away that that. that Jealousy and envy is learn the joy of giving to others. Learn the joy of giving to others. When you give to others, you want to bless others. When you give to others, you say that, I want, wish you success, I wish you joy. And the joy of that will come into your life. And then you know that, hey, I'm no longer so envy and jealous of that person. Now, do you know sometimes, even if the person is richer than you and all this, but the person may not living a good life than you have? It's not always a better life. Do you know that? And sometimes you don't know what's going on in the house. They may live in a big mansion. You don't know what's going on in the house. I'd rather be, have a small house with a happy family than a big house with unhappy people. What do you think? Amen? Yeah. So don't envy. Don't, jealous. don't be jealous of other people. Don't be envious of other people. Enjoy what you have that God has gifted you. The next one. So this is, what is this? Jealousy and envy. The next one is anger. Uh Anger. Strong feeling of displeasure, annoyance, hostility against something or someone. Most of the time, it's someone than something. Because when you're getting angry at something, the thing won't say anything to you. You know, it's just there. But when you're angry at someone, people react. And then you get more angry. That's always the case. And then it leads to sin. Now, Christian counselors report that 50% of people who come in for counseling problems have a problem dealing with anger. 50%. That's huge. All right? Now, anger is not always a sin. You must know that. Jesus was angry, isn't it? When was Jesus angry? When? His temper was exploited. People are supposed to, to, 
to go there and to worship and to pray. But th then, you know, there was this, this uh, people at the market, you know, exploiting uh, people, selling doves, that, that money, you know, are charging a lot of money. There's money changes there. And Jesus was angry. And Jesus actually overturned all the tables. And he says that, you know, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Righteous anger. This is righteous indignation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But anger can become sinful when, number one, it is unproductive, causing misunderstanding. What are unproductive? When you choose not to listen to the person. When they choose miscommunication. There's miscommunication. I don't want to listen to the end. I don't like what you say. I'm selective hear hearer. You know, this can happen when you do not understand, when you do not perceive, when you do not understand where the person is coming from and you chose to say, I'm not going to listen. And you're angry because the person may not be listening to you either. And the person may not be, be listening to what you say or accepting what you say. And there's anger. Do you know that husbands and wives, actually anger is something that, a miscommunication is something that number one, number one, number one in the area of divorce. We have counseled a lot of uh, 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 marriages, counselor couples, and they get angry with each other. And then they will say, I'm not listening to you, I'm not listening, and they either no communication or miscommunication. You know, I always tell married couples, if you are married, always remember this, that your enemy is never your, your spouse is never your enemy. Your spouse is never your enemy. Your enemy is Satan. Ephesians 6 tells us this. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. All right? We're wrestling against the principalities, the wickedness, you know, and the rulers, the wickedness that sit in heavenly places. We are all children of the Lord. Why are we angry with one another? Shouldn't we try to understand before we seek to understand before we, under, uh, you know, um, um, Stephen Covey, you know, the author of uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People say, you must first try, seek to understand before being understood. Seek to understand. All right? So that's motivated by pride because pride says, uh, motivated by pride because pride says, you're not listening to what I'm saying. You're not listening to what I am telling you. I am, I am, I am. So that's pride. So when you're motivated by pride, it becomes angry when people are not listening to you or accepting what you say. And anger is, must not be allowed to fester or to linger. Ephesians 4, 26, 27 says, do not let the enemy gain a foothold in your anger. Do you know that if you sin by anger, you are letting the enemy have a foothold in your life? And a foothold soon becomes a habit. A habit becomes a stronghold. And a stronghold becomes a bondage. And that's where you have problems when anger overtakes your judgment. Violence sets in. The result is death. Recognizing and admitting our prideful anger, that is the first thing we need to do. Know that you have anger, prideful anger. Admit to yourself and say, Lord, I, I really acknowledge that I have this and I don't really know what to do about it. Help me to overcome this. And later on, we'll talk a little bit about that. By letting go, letting God take our vengeance. Do you know that revenge is mine? God says, I shall repay. But if you repay evil for evil, what's that? More evil comes. You sin more against the Lord. But the Lord says, give it to me. Let me be your avenger. Let me take your vengeance. I know what's happened to him in that situation, why he's reacting like this. And I know the situation that both of you have. But let me be the judge of all this. And I, in my grace, will be able to, 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 to help you all to manage it, to help you all to reconcile or restore that. So can we allow God to be our, <coughs> our avenger? <coughs> I think just now I ran too much. I'm so thirsty already, darling. Can you please give me some water? Yeah, this is not one of the management of anger, but this is what I request from you. 
All right. <laughs> All right. True. If reliance on the Holy Spirit is important, because do you know that anger is a. It, it, uh, there's not much left actually. <laughs> By reliance on the Holy Spirit, you cannot overcome this alone. Cannot. You must overcome this. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within you. And you must allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and to lead you. Do you know that anger, uh, self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit? And anger is losing self-control. It's one of the ways of losing self-control. When, you, uh, when you're angry, you lose control. So God says that, you know, let me handle it. Let me have your anger. And let me release to you how to take care of the anger in you. So, one of the very practical things that I want to talk about is through effective verbal communication. I say effective because most of the time, verbal communication are not very effective. Well, when you communicate, one has to listen and the other talks. When, you, when the other talks, you have to listen. When you talk, the other person has to listen, especially in a couple. You give it two talk. One day there was a, somebody tells me that, you know, and I read this. Uh, uh, the first year of marriage, the husband talked and the wife listened. The second year of marriage, the wife talked and the husband listened. And the third year of marriage, they both talked and the neighbors listened. Because you quarrel. You shout at each other. You get angry. And so neighbors are listening. So effective verbal communication is so important in a marriage relationship especially. And in all top forms of relationship, I would say. No, expectations of each other needs, needs to be articulated and needs to be communicated. And thank you, Angel. You're so kind. Thank you so much, dear. Right. Be honest and speak gently to one another. You know, the first thing we always react when a person is angry and the tone of her voice and his voice raised up, right? We want to raise higher because I can never let him or her win me. I must raise higher. I'm husband eh, your wife, okay? Uh, so you must submit to me everything that I say. So that kind of tone. Now, sometimes it's the tone of the voice. It's not the words that you say. It's the tone of the voice. I can say, I don't want to eat. Very loudly. I don't want to eat. Lah. I can say that gently. Say the same thing. The words are the same. But the tonage is different. The intonation is different. So be honest and speak gently. Proverbs 15, 1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. If you are harsh, it stirs up anger within you. So attack the problem, not the person. All right? The problem is this. The issue is this. I'm not attacking you. I'm attacking the issue that is a re- arisen up from whatever it is. So always remember the person that you're talking to, especially your brother and sister in Christ, is not your enemy. All right? The, your enemy is Satan. But he tries to use people around you to create problems and make you sin against him. And when you're angry, you give the devil a foothold, and there's a sin area. And that the sin area, when you put a sin area, there's a sin there, and that people, you know, you're inviting the enemy to come, come into your life. So act and don't react. So, this is anger. Hit the box. Don't hit the person. All right. Pride is another big thing, okay? Pride stems from self-righteousness is sin, which is sin, and God hates it because it is a hindrance to seeking Him. This is exactly what happened to the enemy, isn't it? Lucifer, before he fell to become Satan, he was Lucifer in the heavens and he wanted to usurp the worship that the angels gave to Jesus or gave to God. And because of that, God kicked him out of heaven and then he came to earth. God hates those who proclaim their self-righteous. The wicked are too proud to seek God. They seem to think that God is dead. God is not dead. God is so alive. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our own achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. God hates pride. It it always takes the form of self-righteousness. 
takes the form of self-exaltation and selfish ambition. It was a sin of disobedience that Adam and Eve actually ate the forbidden fruit. But do you know that when the devil comes and, 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 and you know, he tempts Eve, he said that, are you sure God says that? Because when you open your eyes, you will be like God. So if I'm prideful, I say, yes, I like to be like God. I want to be like God. I want to be God. That's the pride that's running in there. That caused a person to disobey. How do we then overcome it? How do we overcome pride? Adopt there are a few, three main things. Adopt a searching attitude. Search your heart. King David said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. The heart is deceitful above all else. Who, who can know it? Not even yourself sometimes. Only God knows your heart and God sees your heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. Points out anything in me that offends you, God. And then lead me along the path of everlasting life. Search. Got to do a search. Sometimes we want to, do, want to find out something, we go Google and we do a search. But it's so with us that God says, search your own heart. You know, ask me to reveal anything in your heart that is offending me and I will show you. You know, so sometimes we need to do that in our own quiet time. Adopt a servanthood attitude. That's the antidote of pride. When you are a servant, you are humbling, humbling yourself down before him. That is the an antidote. And, and, and remember this incident where, Jesus, where the disciples are asking Jesus, who do you think is the greatest in the kingdom of God and all this? And they try to be one of the greatest and all. And Jesus told them this. In this world, the kings and great men lord it over the people. Yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, listen to this, but among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you shall take the lowest rank, and those leaders shall be like a servant to you. Now, DG leaders, one of the things about leadership is you lead by serving, and you serve by leading. All right? You serve, you lead by serving, and you serve by leading your people. That is servanthood attitude as a shepherd. And the last one is adopt a submissive attitude. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For Christ, out of reverence of, for Christ. Submit yourself unto another. Submit to the government. Submit to the laws of the land. Wives, submit to your husbands in all things. Submit yourself to one another. Even though a pastor can submit to a, a, a member, submit to one another. That is what God wants at the end of the day. So that there will be order in the family. There will be unity in the family and in the working place and in all aspects. Number five is grief and sorrow. So this is pride. Throw it away, Blackie. So next is grief and sorrow. I'll go quickly. Grief is always accompanied by sorrow and has all these kind of uh, qualities or kind of uh, the symptoms. A series of disappointments when people you love disappoint you is always <laughs> grieve you. Your, your, your husband may grieve you, disappoint you. Your boss may disappoint you, telling you that I promised you a promotion, but then it didn't come through. You know, your heart broken repeatedly and a shattered relationship, your heart being battered and bruised from repeated attacks from the enemy, anguish over long-term problems, perhaps in a marriage relationship, and then a myriad of other discouraging, devastating, and damaging life events, such as the loss of a loved one. Women tend to be broken, more broken emotionally, I can tell you this, but men, you are also broken, but it's just that you don't show it. Am I right? Woman, you cry it, and it's crying, it's just actually letting out of that and becomes a healing in the process. But man, you keep a lot of things to yourself. And that doesn't mean that you know you are not being grieved, you're not grieving. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. There's a lot of sorrow. The spirit is broken. A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. When it, the bones are dry up, you, you, you go into a state of depression if you allow grief and sorrow to spiral down. 
So arrest that before it's too late. Now, my dad passed away in 2003. And my best friend, Jenny, in, in ministry, in my previous church, she passed away in 2004, breast cancer. And my mom passed away because of a, heart, a sudden heart attack two hours after she has attacked in 2005. Twelve days later, my father-in-law passed away because of st st stomach cancer. And then my older sister passed away in 2006 because of cancer of the breast. In just four short years, five of my loved ones passed on. And I said, and you know, sometimes you joke in the family, who's next? Grief. We have not even overcome the grief period. Another one passed away. Another one passed away. Twelve days later, my father-in-law passed away. But how do we handle this? How do we handle grief? It's not that, you know, grief is something that we, we, we ask for it, you know. But it comes because of something that has happened. So what, first of all, we must understand that we need to bind up the spirit of grief. Don't let it fester too much, too long until it goes down into a state of depression. A lot of people get depressed because they do not know how to handle the grief. Yes, love once passed away, we need to grieve. But for a period of time, we do not grieve as, as if like we have no hope. All my brother, all, all the, those that, you know, my, my parents and my friends and my father-in-law, they are all Christians. They have gone up to heaven. And so when we grieve, we say, God, you know, we are going to meet up with them. We're going to be reunited with them. So we do not grieve with their, like a person with no hope. We do see them. And we are reunited with them. Bind the spirit of grief. Ask the Lord to bind it up if it is causing you to spiral into, uh, into depression. And you need help. You need people to walk alongside with you during that process. I know that. By asking God to restore the joy of your salvation. King David says, restore to me the joy of salvation. Renew a right spirit within me. Right spirit, Lord. I don't want to have a grief spirit. I want to have a right spirit. That I want to honor you and worship you. I have the joy to doing that and not be thinking about loss of a loved ones and missing them and, and cannot function and all that. Depression has such that you cannot function. If depression has set in, one of the symptoms is you cannot function. Regrets and guilt. Everyone experience, experiences a certain amount of shame and regret over sins that, or decisions that we have made, committed in the past, maybe in the present, things and decisions that we have, you know, made and we are not proud of ourselves, we enter into that thing and we say that, you know, God, we have these undesirable consequences that happen to us. And I'm really regretting it, Lord. I really feel guilty about it. The Lord says, I know. But would you allow me to take away your regrets and your guilt and be able to give you, you know, um, the reconciliation, restoration of yourself back to me? Are you sin against me? Yes, I know. But I want you to myself. I want you, I, do want, I want to have you. I do not want you to be laden with regrets and shame and guilt all your life. It's very tiring, isn't it? To be burdened by regrets in the past. And then you say, oh, I should have done that. I should have done this. But you, you, yeah, that is in the past already, right? Can we move forward with God's healing upon us? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. But whatever man sows, that he will also reap. That is the law of the harvest. If you reap undesirable consequences because of decisions that you have not made, God is able to turn that around. Romans 8.28 says that. And I've experienced it personally myself. Did a lot of uh, things that I'm not proud of. You know, a lot of decisions and choices that I've made are not good. Consider uh, considerable, undesirable consequences came. But God has set me free. Amen? And God is going to set you free also. If you have regrets, you have guilt, you have shame, just let God enable you to move forward. Press on towards the call. Paul says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of. But one thing I do, what he says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has. Now, if you live with regrets and shame and guilt all your life, you will not be able to move forward because all these things are going to hold you down. But Paul says here, forget about that. Move forward. Change your mindset is very important. 
Know that there is now no condemnation for those who are Christ Jesus. A lot of us have condemnation thoughts in our mind and no good. Really, I should have done that, but I did and this is what I get into and so on. So you, you pity party yourself. But God says, there's no condemnation. I'm here to forgive you. I love you. And that's it. No condemnation. So you must choose to forgive yourself. Now, a lot of people are very hard on themselves. They can for ask God to forgive them, very easy. They can forgive others, okay. But they cannot forgive themselves. Do you know one of the greatest healing of, of yourself is to forgive yourself, th those things that you've done wrong? Don't be so hard on yourself. Yes, know that you have done wrong. Move on and do things that are right. Don't always do just things that are right, but do the right thing. All right? I always tell my, my daughter, don't always do things that are right, it's good, but do the right thing, not do things right. Do the right thing. You'll move on and do the right thing. Ask God to help you, lead you, guide you. That's where the Holy Spirit is for. Fear, anxiety, we're going to the end. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And fear is not just an emotion, but it is a spirit, as it's told by uh, Apostle Paul. And this is unhealthy fear arising from a trauma, an accident, or some event that's happened in a person's life. And so fear crept in. Now, fear can be very crippling and can paralyze a believer. And you can find that I, I'm so fearful that I don't, don't want to do anything, you know. You're, you're just, uh, just inside your own room and you're just crippling with fear. The fear of dying, the fear of, you know, things may come, the fear of ghosts or may or whatever that is coming into your mind. You're just paralyzed by the fear. Anxiety is worrying about things that have not happened and may never even happen. That's why the Lord said, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow has worries about itself already. Enough is a day of its own troubles. Why are we worried? You know, worry means that we do not trust God enough. When we worry, we don't trust in the Lord. It's the Lord, Philippians 4, 6 is very, very, very clear. Do not be anxious in every situation. With thanksgiving, let your request be. Be known, made known to God. And the peace of God will come. Jesus said, I do not come to just give you everything that you need, but I will I guarantee you when you seek me, I will give you the peace. Because the peace of God is important in a state of fear. When you have fear, you don't find it yourself peaceful or things around you peaceful. Amen? Isn't it? You need that assurance. Walk with God. As we always say, walk with God. Let faith rise us because the antidote for fear is always faith. You remember in disciple, the disciples in the boat, uh, chapter 4 in Mark, and, and the disciples were on the, on, the, on the Sea of Galilee. Now it's very dark at around that time in the Sea of Galilee if you've been to uh, Israel. And then there's a, the wind and the storm coming up and Jesus was sleeping in the stern and they say, Jesus, you don't, don't you even care? Don't you even care that we are drowning? I'm drowning, you know. I'm drowning in my spiritual life. I'm drowning in my physical problem. I'm drowning because I have no finances, God. I'm drowning. Don't you not care for me? And you know what Jesus' response was? He said, why are you so afraid? I'm here. You men of little faith, why are you so afraid? And I see that God is saying to some of us in this situation where we are so worried and anxious about a lot of things. And one thing is needful to, to Mary. He says, Mary has chosen the better one. And sit down at my feet to worship me. Then you, Martha, you're too distracted with so many things. You're so worried about so many things. But one thing is needful. And, and, and Mary has chosen the better part. To sit down at my feet and worship him. Walk with Jesus. Declare and believe God's promises. The Bible has seven over thousand promises. Declare and say to yourself, God, I can do it. I'm going to declare to myself, I know the plans that you have for me and not plans to prosper me, not to harm me, plans to give me a hope and a future. Do you believe that? How many of you believe that? Jeremiah 29, 11. If you believe that, and that's what God says, that settles it. Addiction is another big thing. I think two already here. Addiction 
rise us out of temptation. In fact, um, there, are, there are actually are two sides of a coin. Habitual sins such as pornography, gambling, drinking, smoking, drug addiction, online games, online movies are some easy, seldom easy to get rid of, even with Christians who may be walking faithfully with the Lord. When tempted, no one should say, well, one thing that I want us to understand is temptation is not a sin. Huh? Really? Yes, it's not a sin. But if you yield to temptation, it becomes a sin. So, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. The desire, after it has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And then sin, when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. Like HIV, when it's full grown, full blown AIDS, it gives birth to it, it will die. You will die from it. Full blown HIV. All right? So it's full grown, it gives birth to death. So every time you say, the devil makes me do it, the devil is like this, the devil is like that, you have a choice. You have a choice to flee from temptation. You have a choice to say, no, I'm not going to do it. God, you are in me and, and the whole, I'm the temple, body of the temple of the Holy Spirit, my body is. I'm not going to give in to temptation. I'm not going to give in to watching pornography because it, create, it corrupts your mind. And then when your mind is filled with that, what kind of mind would you want? You want the mind of Christ. You don't want a mind that is filled with fantasizing about other women and all. I'm very, 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 very uh, direct here, I hope. I have no, no apologies to it because in the end of the last days, we want to be people walking with God. We want the people that are strong, walking with God, holy, Pure before God. Can I hear an amen? amen? Confess and repent. What is, what is it that you have been doing? Acknowledge your issue. Confess, repent. And you can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. You must have the Holy Spirit enabling you, empowering you to overcome sins. Because the arm of the flesh is so strong. And Jesus said what? He said that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you must overcome that by the greater empowerment of the Holy Spirit over your flesh. Find an accountability friend. We always tell people when through our ministry that who is your good friend that you can trust and that you can share your problems with so that this friend can come alongside you and Hold you accountable. How's your work? How's your week this week? How's everything? Did you go back to that sin area? Your friend will hold you accountable. And then you will begin, begin to find the victory slowly but surely. Last one but not least is offense and unforgiveness. Offense is an annoyance or resentment brought about, perceived insult. It is a perception, okay? Sometimes the person may not say things to you to hurt you intentionally or unintentionally, but it's perceived by you that the person is saying these things to hurt me. Brought about by perceived insult due to or disregard for oneself. For many people, the tendency to take offense at little things is rooted in a false perspective of security. Now, our security, in, for some people, security is based on performance. And we feel threatened when we are not performing enough or when people say negative things about our own performance. And people give feedback, but we are taking it very, very negatively. In fact, it's a good feedback, it's constructive, but we're taking it negatively because of our own false perspective of security. We base on our security on our performance. And when our performance is not doing well, people give it, uh, feedback, we get offended. You think you can do better than me, is it? You try lah. This is what goes on in our mind. We get offended, we get hurt. 
ways to become being offended. Number one is choose to love and to understand. If it's forced kind of security, then choose to understand the other person, where the, the other person is coming from. Love covers a multitude of sins. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. How to overcome offenses is to love. And not just love, love each other deeply, Peter says. And love is something that God advocates and God's commandment. And there's no option, brothers and sisters, no option not to love, no option not to forgive. It is, they are, these are commandments of God. And if we are obeying God's commandments, we are called His disciples, isn't it? We need to understand where the person comes from and why is she reacting the way she does. Perhaps she doesn't even mean what she said and we react. And then after that, I don't want to talk to this person anymore. I'm going to leave. I'm going to go somewhere else because, you know, I'm not going to look at this person in the eye. I just can't. I have gone through a lot of that. I get offended very easily. And God has to teach me to humble me down to look at the person as God sees that person and still forgive and choose to love. There's no two ways about it. Choose to forgive the person who offended you. Ephesians 4.31 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. If we say that we cannot forgive the person, do you know your standard of forgiveness is higher than God? If God says, I can forgive him, I can forgive you, he says, I can't forgive myself, I can't forgive this person. That means your standard of forgiveness is higher than God. God is holy and he can forgive. But yet we unholy people cannot forgive. Think about it. It's a choice that you choose to forgive. Lastly, I want to wrap this up by saying, focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says that we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. This is how do we actually keep our healing after all that's been said and done? How do we keep our healing eventually? Focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Focus on Him. The, the, the Greek word for author is akigos, which means founder or leader, and finisher is called tileo which is to make perfect, to complete. God has, Jesus has done on the cross already for us uh, and He has won the race. He's victorious. He has broken all the, the things that we need to break the chains of. But some of us still in a process. We all, the sanctification is always a process. And so we are in the process of being matured in Christ. So on the, at the end of that line, that race, please always focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all there is to it. At the end, I say, Jesus, you know, you're, the, you're, you're at the end of running towards you. Don't go and sidetrack. Don't know it, it's distracted by other things. Just continue your race. I want to encourage you that. Number two is focus on the work of the Holy Spirit. As we say that it's not by might, not by power, but by the power, but not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit. Um, can you all read that over there? Did any one of you see that all the descriptions over there? Do you like that verse? Yes, appropriate that verse in your life. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit that I'll do this. All right? So you have the Holy Spirit, walk in victory of the Holy Spirit, and continue to uh, not gratify the desires of the flesh, as it says in Galatians. All right, new renewing of our mind. This is a very important thing. He says, do not copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Changing your mindset, that is, the way you think. It's called metanoia. Change your mindset. And we need that change of mindset in our mind. We need that. And right now, I want to, I want to show you something. Darlene, can you bring me that table over there? That table? Yeah, with all the... I'm not doing magic, but I'm just showing you how the changing of the mind can help you. As you continue to dwell on the Lord, as you continue to meditate on the Word of God, this can happen to you. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Philippians 4, whatever things are noble, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, good report, virtue, praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, if you can worry about finances, you can meditate. Because meditation means 
in your mind, you keep thinking, 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 thinking about the thing. So, here you have your mind. It may be corrupted by a lot of things. It may be thinking about a lot of things. It may have worries inside. It may have fear inside and all this. And here you have God, the Holy Spirit, which is pure. All right, without any blemish. And then what are you going to do? Word of God, renew your mind. This is how it goes. Whatever, can everybody read that? Whatever bread, as I pour into here, you will see the change in your mind with the word of God. Everybody read together. Finally, brethren. Keep going, keep going. Keep pouring, keep filling yourself with the Holy Spirit, keep filling with the Word of God, and then what's going to happen is that this is your mind. Renewing your mind, the Word of God. Let it seep in, let meditation come in, and let it dwell on it, whatever is true, Philippians 4.8. Focus on prayer and praise. The second last one. Prayer is a weapon against the enemy. It is the one that the uh, spiritual weapon to wage warfare against the enemy. And prayer is the power that will nail down the enemy once and for all. All right. Watch and pray. Jesus said that you will not fall into temptation and don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord. That is worship. Yeah? And the last one is really focus on fellowship of the saints. The fellowship of the saints is important, accountability purposes. Let's not be, let's, let's think of ways to motivate one another in love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And I want to encourage all of us do not neglect the meeting of our house groups, our DGs. Because this is important. The day of His coming is near. But let us come together. Let us encourage one another. Build each other up. Motivate each other to good works. Help one another. Be accountable for one another. Stir up one another. Focus on the fellowship of the saints and then focus on endurance and pers uh, perseverance. 2 Corinthians 4.16 Therefore, do not lose heart. Remember at the end of Hebrews 12, 4, do not lose heart, do not be weary. Even though your outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Give a chance for the Holy Spirit to work within you, will you? For our light affliction, which is for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. So, lastly, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Do you, will you run, fight a good fight? Would you run this race? Would you keep this faith? I want the worship team to come up. I'm going to end this by a declaration. We're going to declare. We want everybody to stand up. You've been seated down long enough. Just stand up. And we're going to declare this because there's power in declaration. There's power in telling, you know, God, this is the things I believe. This is what is happening, but this is the way I, I believe and I want to be victorious. We're going to declare in a short while, while Pastor Trisha will play on the piano quietly, and then we are going to read this together. Ready? Are you ready? One, two, three. I declare that I am secured in the love of God. I am accepted and loved by God. I am assured that God works for my good in all circumstances. I am free from any condemnation brought against me by the enemy, and I cannot be separated from the love of God. 
I declare that I'm forgiven, I have forgiven, and I will continue to choose to forgive, especially those who have offended me. My life has been established, anointed, and sealed by the Holy Spirit. My life is hidden with Christ in God, and I'm confident that God will complete the good work He started in me. I'm a citizen of heaven, and I have not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, of power, and of sound mind. I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. I'm significant as I'm a branch of Jesus Christ who is the true vine. I've been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. I'm God's temple and a minister of reconciliation for God. I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. Amen. I'm God's workmanship and I approach God with freedom and confidence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have the victory in Christ. And I'm called to be an overcomer as Christ has overcome the world. And in Him, I'm more than a conqueror. I declare that I will focus upon the Lord despite what is happening around me. And I will rely on His Word and the Holy Spirit to guide and counsel me. I declare that I will continue to pray and not be weary and not give up. Lord Jesus, help me to fight the good fight, to finish the race, and to keep the faith. And all this we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's give God the glory. Hallelujah. We're going to sing a song, The Victor's Crown. And let's make it as a prayer to the Lord this morning.